Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Welcome to Live 58 Church Service. My name is Ken Berkey, and this is the infamous, the famous <laughs> Sam Doherty. I've known her all the way back to when she was Sam Small. That's Sam, right. How are you today? I'm doing well, everybody. Glad that you guys are here with us this morning. Yeah. Uh, how's your week been? It's been good. Busy? Busy always. Kids back at school? Almost. Almost. Can't oh, wait. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not Counting know down, you, yeah, five that, days. You have survived a year. I know. Of that. Wow. I've got some great hair to show yeah, for it, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us today. And uh, this service, we are starting a three-part series uh, beginning with Holy Week today. And uh, we're going to, this week, have a, a, a devotional each day based on what Jesus was doing each day of the week on Holy Week leading up to the cross. We have a Good Friday service. Awesome. Ten, starts at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, but I mean, it premieres at 10 o'clock. You can watch it anytime on Friday. And then we're gonna have our big Easter service starting at 10 o'clock too, so. What do you got plans for this week, Easter? Just work? Yeah, no, not just work. Okay, Definitely good. gonna be following your devotionals. Okay, well. um, family, <laughs> always um, looking forward just to joining you know, Live 58 on Sunday for Easter services as well. So. Yeah, I'm excited. We've been filming some of the stuff and I think it's just gonna be just good to get focused this yeah. week and, and focus on the cross. Um, we have a, a May 22nd, which is a World Vision 6K Walk Run. And uh, you can sign up for that online right now. Uh, you can go to our website, live58.church, go to the World Vision and sign up, put in clean water, yeah. and you get a discount. Awesome. And we're going to be raising money and awareness for uh, safe water around the world. I hope your boys join us. I know. We're, Jake's already in training. Yeah. He's out there running. Really? You probably really? see him in the hood. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in training too. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I'm walking. I'm walking. I know. You know, uh, well, it, it is a great family event. Though. Yeah. It's a great family event and invite your friends because it just raises great awareness. It's cool that your boys at their age, junior high age, yeah, junior are high. so much more aware of the world than we were. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, I, again, we're glad that you're here. Anything else that we're supposed to <laughs> share as we, hey, just keep praying for uh, the church, our yeah. building to open up uh, that special use permit because uh, we are very excited about that. We'll keep you up to date on that. So. Awesome. Yeah. Is that it? That's it. That's it. I'm so glad, Sam, you joined us today. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> hey, you know what? Uh, just Sam behind the scenes is amazing. She gets things done. She is a blessing to our church, and we just wanted to torture you by I, putting by you. You did. By, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this morning, everybody. Yeah. Hey, would you mind? I would not mind at all. Mind? Oh, good. Cool. Lord, thank you so much for bringing us all together in the various different spots that we're out in, in today. We just ask God that you just open up our hearts and our minds to your message, um, especially on the eve of a holy week as we um, prepare for Easter. We thank you, Lord, so much for the amazing um, gift and sacrifice of, of your son. And we just pray, Lord, that you are just a, a huge presence um, and just help us through this uh, week. And we just pray again, God, that you just open our hearts and our minds um, to the words that Ken are going to be sharing. And we thank you for the blessing of uh, Live 58 in this uh, community. We love you and praise you in your name. Amen. Amen.
your joy awaits my praise. Come on, sing it out. I give thanks for all you have done, and I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing, Lord. I am grateful. I'm grateful, Lord. When I was down, you brought me out. our hands together and sing this out and as we lift our hands the heavens open heavens open so let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us and as we together I give thanks here we go I give thanks
The Bible says that as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, he sent two of them to get a donkey and a colt. This fulfilled the prophecy in Zechariah. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus mounted the donkey and rode into Jerusalem. Many laid their cloaks on the road before him and brought palm branches to wave and celebrate. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. But not all who were there understood him. Some called him only a prophet, believing him wise but denying his divinity. Some raged and cheered for a revolution, hoping he would liberate them from their oppressors. To others, he was nothing more than an interruption. Even as children ran to him and shouted for joy, his enemies wove through the crowd, watching, seething, plotting. The range of reactions was great and wide. Celebration, worship, revolutions, Deception, cynicism, condemnation, boredom, disinterest. But every single person had to confront one thing, who he was. Behold, your king is coming to you. Well, if you knew it was your last week to live, what would you do? What would you say? If you knew, you would probably make sure the most important messages were said, the most important activities were done, and the most important relationships were embraced. Most of us don't think about this because we think we have more time. But when my sister was dying, she knew she had just days to live. So she spent her time with her family, sharing her thoughts about how much she loved us, how proud she was of her children, how she wanted me to conduct her funeral. She sang songs about Jesus, and it was clear what her priorities were when she knew she only had days to live. Her priorities, family, friends, and faith. Well, Jesus knew it was his last week. So he made sure the most important things were done, said, important relationships embraced, and ultimately his actions on this last week and his teachings on this last week literally changed everything. On Sunday, before his crucifixion, Christ rode into Jerusalem on a humble donkey to present himself as the Lamb of God, and he changed people's expectations from Jesus being an earthly king to becoming an eternal king who would save us from our sins. When he told the story about the wedding feast on this last week, he changed the expectations of what it takes to get to heaven. It's not about religion or race or who who we belong to. It's not about how good we are, but heaven is available to all who receive God's grace. When we look at the life of Judas and Peter, who both failed Jesus miserably on this last week. Our expectations were changed when we saw it is never too late to change. It is never too late to repent. It is never too late to come back to Christ. And today, today, in this story of Jesus, once again on this last week leading to the cross, Jesus will change our expectation and our understanding about what prayer is. In Luke chapter 22, it says Jesus went out. This is, this is Friday, right before he's going to be arrested. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And on reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. And here's the prayer I want to look at today. Father, if you are willing, <clears throat> take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. This is an interesting story. And what's interesting about it to me is this. I believe prayer is one of the greatest gifts and most powerful tools we have as human beings. Prayer can give us the power to change 
the circumstances in our lives. I believe that. I've seen it. I know it's true. But also, and maybe more importantly, there are times when we know prayer will not change the circumstances around us. We know that we're going to pray, but God's not going to change what's going to happen. And that prayer many times serves a different purpose and dare I say a more impacting and important and life transforming purpose. As the great theologian Soren Kierkegaard said, the function of prayer is not to influence God, but rather to change the nature of the one who prays. This prayer by Jesus right before he's arrested, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. It wasn't going to be answered by the Father, which leads to some interesting questions that has been asked throughout the history of mankind. What happens when God doesn't answer my prayers the way I want them to be answered? What do I do when God says no? What good does it do me to pray when I'm pretty sure God's not going to change the circumstances all that much? Well, here in Luke chapter 22, Jesus prays for God to take this cup from him. What does this mean? What is, what is this cup? Well, if you go back to the Old Testament, you'll find this image of the cup. It's not a new idea. Isaiah chapter 51 says, Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, you who have drained to its dregs the goblet that makes men stagger. Jeremiah said it like this. This is what the Lord says. Take from my hand this cup, Filled to the brim with my anger and make all the nations to whom I send you drink from it. When they drink from it, they will stagger. Crazed by the warfare, I will send against them. Simply said, this cup that Jesus is being asked to be spared from is God's wrath. It's God's anger. This cup this is what's such, so fascinating about the story. This cup is the reason Jesus came to earth. It's the reason he took on the form of man. It's the reason he had preached and taught and healed to crowds uh, for three years. This cup that Jesus is being asked to have passed from him is the very point of his existence. This week, as we enter into Holy Week, this is a huge time to remember. It's a huge time to remember that Jesus came to die for us. He came as our substitute. He came to pay the price for our sins. Jesus came to drink the cup of God's wrath so we would not have to taste it for ourselves. That's why he was born. That's why he came. That's why he died on the cross. And now, just hours before the deed is about to be done, the whole reason he comes, Jesus prays, if it's possible... May this cup be taken from me. And Jesus didn't just pray this prayer once. Matthew records him repeating that prayer three times. So here's the question. Did Jesus think this prayer would change his destiny? Did Jesus believe there was another way to get the job done? I don't think so. So why did he pray the prayer? If Jesus knew the Father was going to deny his request, if Jesus knew the Father was going to say no, if Jesus knew his prayer wasn't going to change the destiny of the cross, then why pray? And the answer is, because prayer isn't always about changing our circumstances and fixing our problems. Sometimes, and more importantly, prayer is about laying a hold of God, laying a hold of his strength, his comfort, his wisdom, laying a hold of the will for our lives. As Mother Teresa said, prayer is not asking. Prayer is putting oneself in the hands of God at his disposition and listening to his voice in the depths of our hearts. You see, too often, myself included, I've seen prayer as if it were like a magic in, in, incantation. Incantation. You just say the right words in the right way at the right time, abracadabra, presto, changeo, and everything becomes better. But that's bad theology. A few years ago, a pro football player who professed to be a Christian was talking to a sports writer about his game-winning catch in the Super Bowl. Speaking about the catch, he said, that was all God. I knew I had to turn left, and then I stuck my hands out, and God did all the rest. Something about that, an that answer troubled this sports writer who also happened to be a Christian. So he went on to ask him about a recent car accident this athlete had had. 
This player's vehicle had flipped several times, but he walked away unscathed because, as he claimed, he just re kept repeating the word Jesus over and over. And the writer then asked him if another professed Christian, golfer Payne Stewart, would have survived his plane crash had he done the same thing. And the ath athlete flippantly said, oh yeah, definitely. Then the writer asked him about another professed Christian athlete, Kansas City linebacker Derek Thomas, who died from injury sustained in a wreck, and about the Columbine High School student who was shot after affirming her belief in God. And like a prosecuting attorney, the writer probed and questioned until he had exposed the shallowness of this player's understanding of prayer. Now, this player was a good guy. He was a good Christian. He just had bad theology when it came to prayer. The writer went on to write that prayer obviously has to be more than a magic locket or an incantation that would ward off evil. So why pray? If I can't always get what I want, why pray? If I can't always avoid danger and pain and sorrow and even death, why pray? Well, the easiest answer is that sometimes prayer does indeed change circumstances around us. I've seen it. I've seen where prayer has brought healing. I've seen when prayer has brought people back from the brink of death. I've seen times when prayer has defied the belief that nothing will change. I have seen that, but I have also seen and I've experienced times when prayer has a different purpose, a purpose that stands strong in the face of circumstances that may not change. The purpose of prayer is best summed up by the following poem, just two phrases. This is just beautiful. I'll put it on the screen. Sometimes God stills the storm of the sea. At other times, he stills the storms within me. Sometimes God stills the storms of the sea. He does. At other times, though, he stills the storms within me. <clears throat> that night in the garden, Jesus needed some storms calmed. Jesus felt a need for that kind of calmness. So he withdrew a stone's throw beyond, knelt down, and he prayed. And it was as if Jesus were being drawn, physically pulled down to his knees in prayer. He was feeling the weight of the cup of God's anger, of God's wrath. And he had to talk to his daddy. He had to talk to his father, to his Abba. Jesus had to share the anxiety of what was being laid upon him. He knew the cup wasn't going to be taken from him. He knew his father wasn't going to change a thing. He just needed time with his dad. Several years ago, my son was working in one of the most dangerous areas of Brooklyn, New York, and uh, he had had a rough week and a long week. And so he and I talked one night late, and he had had 18-hour days. He was walking in dangerous projects. He was dealing with, with another shooting. And as his dad, I couldn't change anything. But there was something that was settling for my son to be able to talk to his papa, to be able to talk to his dad. Jesus just needed time with his daddy. It says in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. And I love this part of the story. Where was it that Jesus' sweat was like drops of blood? Was it when he got arrested? When, it, when, when he was in front of the Sanhedrin? When he was in Pilate's Hall? When Judas betrayed him? When Peter denied him? When he walked up the hill of Golgotha carrying the cross? No, he sweat drops of blood where? In the Garden of Gethsemane in prayer. And if we would have witnessed his struggle that night, we might have said, if he's so broken up just while he's praying, what is he going to do when he faces a real crisis? Why can't he approach this ordeal like his, with the calmness and confidence of his three sleeping friends? And yet, when the time came for the tests, Jesus walked to the cross with courage and his friends fell apart and ran away. What made the difference? Prayer. It was time of prayer with his Abba, with his Father. It was the time of prayer that gave Jesus strength. It was the time of prayer that gave Jesus courage. It was the time of prayer that gave Jesus the power to face the pain, the humiliation, the, 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 the cup of wrath, the cross. To experience the cup, the wrath of God, he went to prayer so that you and I would not have to experience that cup. And that's the kind of prayer I've been thinking about, I need to pray more. 
I need that kind of, I need to learn how to pray that kind of prayer. Because it's the type of prayer that can give us all the ability to face the hard tests of life, which we all face. And really, there are just two simple elements to this prayer that can help our prayers give us strength and courage during difficult times. Just two things. The first part of this prayer that Jesus prays to his father, his Abba, is it's just a prayer of honesty. It's just honesty. When Jesus prayed in the garden, he was brutally honest. There were no religious platitudes, no sugarcoating. He knew what was about to occur. So he just said, Father, I got to be honest. If you're willing, take this cup away. He knew what was about to happen. He knew what had to be done. But he still, three separate times, says, I don't know if I really want to do this. You see, there are people who believe that somehow God will be offended if we're honest with him. By telling him our fears, our disappointments, our questions, our doubts, our frustrations. And I can understand that. They're thinking, life has already turned against me. The last thing I need is for God to turn against me. A lot of Christians will say, well, don't ask why. But I'm not in that camp. I'm strong in asking why. Jesus asked why. Children love to ask why. There were children in a Sunday school class that were asked, What's a why question for God? What's a question you have for God? And one little boy said, Dear God, thank you for my baby brother, but why? I prayed for a puppy. A little girl said, Dear God, when my mom makes leftovers, I think this is a great question. She said, Dear God, when my mom makes leftovers, why do I have to pray for the food again? It's pretty good. One kid, he got it right. He just said, dear God, why did the unicorns miss the ark and the skunks made the ark? It's a good question, just a brilliant question. The Bible is full of whys, and the Bible is full of people with questions. As the psalmists cry out, why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Why are you so far from, my, from saving me, so far from my cries and anguish? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Honesty in prayer is a release valve. And therapists understand the need for this. So they will often spend a lot of time in their sessions with troubled patients trying to get them to be honest about their feelings and emotions. Why, why is a statement of faith, not an expression of doubt, because it presupposes that God exists and that he loves us and is in control of our lives. As C.S. Lewis says, God is to be wrestled with. I love that. Jesus in the garden, with all his honesty, is wrestling with his Father. But there's a second part of this prayer. Because being honest with God is not enough. Because honesty left to itself, all by itself, it can lead to expressions of bitterness, sarcasm, destructive anger. In order to be a useful tool, a prayer tool that God gives us strength. This honesty must be coupled with the second half of Jesus' prayer. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus' prayer was a prayer that pressed into the Father, that wrestled with the Father. His, His prayer had power to give Him strength because this honest prayer hinged on His accepting God's will. The prayer that can transform our times of weakness into times of strength are the ones, here it is, I'll put this on the screen too, that that are, these are the prayers that are less concerned with moving God towards our will, and they're more concerned in moving us towards His will. Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane, in the garden, was not a prayer of doubt, weakness, hopelessness, or defeat. It was a prayer of honesty and a prayer of surrender to his heavenly father. And in that surrender, Jesus found the strength to overcome. And it was when Jesus prayed that prayer that the father reached down and comforted him. As it's recorded in Luke, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. It's that. It's that kind of supernatural strength from God that I want in my life. This is a simple message as we start Holy Week. As we start Holy Week and each day we kind of learn what happened leading up to Good Friday and next Easter. And I wanted to start with this kind of prayer. It's that kind of supernatural prayer and strength from God that I want in my life. And let me just say this. This world is fragile and it's fickle. And you and I need this strength 
regardless of our circumstances. Some of our circumstances will change, some of them won't. But God is there. His presence, His strength, His comfort. But first, we must be willing to pray the way Jesus did. Honestly and in full surrender. And there's a great promise that goes with the prayer of surrender. Uh, Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus said it like this. He said, God will give you all you need from day to day if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary purpose. What's the kingdom of God? It's simple. It's his will at work in your life, and it's his will at work in the world. So as we begin this holy week, will you remember some things? As we enter into this last week, May you and I, may we walk in humility as the King of Kings rode into Jerusalem with humility, showing us the path to greatness. This last week, may we not forget the Son of Compassion who absorbed the guilt, rejection, shame, and failure of His brothers and sisters, and He endured the cup so that we could experience His grace. This last week, as we enter into this week, may we remember He came not with thunder or lightning, but in the way of weakness, vulnerability, and in need, in a manger trough, then executed without trial or representation. But this week, this week, join us and let us take time to remember that in that weakness and vulnerability, the world would come to know the love of our Heavenly Father, the compassionate one. The world would behold His glory, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Let's worship together and then we're going to close with a powerful prayer, a prayer that is honest and a prayer full of surrender. The faith can move mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation, waiting here for you. you
Well, thanks for joining us today, and I, I hope you join us all week as we enter into Holy Week. Again, each day this week, Monday through Thursday, I'll be doing devotionals, talking about what Jesus was doing each day of the week leading up to the cross. Join us Friday for our Good Friday services. It premieres at 10 a.m. Of course, you can watch it anytime after that, and then also for our Easter services, 10 a.m. on Sunday. So excited. Thanks for joining us, and thank you over and over, I have to say, for your generosity and giving, whether you give to the P.O. Box or online, uh, through texting, whatever, thank you for that. It allows Live 58 to, to be hope and light in this world, both locally and globally. So thank you for that. And I want to close. I want to close with a prayer. It's one of my favorite prayers. And it is a prayer. You'll notice it's a prayer filled with honesty, and it's a prayer filled with surrender, following the example of Christ. They call it these days the serenity prayer. Will you, it'll be on the screen. Let's just uh, end this with this prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a path to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen.
Singing out. 